Okay, today we're in the Moto IQ garage, and we're going to talk about something that a lot of you have been requesting in your comments, electronic boost control and electronic waste gates. And I don't know a whole lot about them, so I got the country's leading expert, Marty from TurboSmart, <laughs> to help me uh, talk about these. You know, like there's some advantages uh, to the electronic waste gate, and uh, you know, some of it is obviously more accurate boost control, right, Marty? That would be correct. Um, it, it literally comes down to the control and the fact that we are directly controlling the wastegate with electronic circuitry and software. The only limitation is really your, your imagination, really. Um, with pneumatics, the boost control is kind of a byproduct of doing a few various things and overcoming a spring and fighting drive pressure where the electronic wastegate doesn't have those same type of a limitation. Um, so it just opens up a lot more opportunities, really. So in the traditional wastegate, um, you're running uh, boost pressure to fight against the spring to uh, open and close the wastegate. And the boost is modulated by a uh, three-port pneumatic solenoid valve. Typically, yeah. And uh, you know, that's your control loop. So there's a lot more like hysteresis going on, right? Correct. Now, if you don't know, hysteresis is sort of like engineering talk for lag. So <laughs> it's system lag. Um, but, uh, so they have the lag plus, um, you're overcoming the, uh, the pressure of the spring and, uh, you don't have precise control and, um, the electronic wastegate, uh, actually allows this to be controlled directly, right? Correct. So in pneumatics, as you said, you know, you're fighting the spring and you're, you're putting air to the bottom chamber here to move the valve, but you're also having to take into account the drive pressure, the exhaust pressure acting on the face of this valve, and the larger the wastegate is, the more those forces you know, impact the control. So you have all of these things that you're fighting and controlling that are, you know, it's just physics, right? And, you know, it works. You know, every, we're not getting rid of these wastegates. Um, they work fantastic, and, you know, there's a lot of great uh, companies out there that can control these just fine. However, these physical limitations do rear their head in you know, the top levels of motorsports, like you said, Pikes Peak, that's affected by altitude or diesel drag racing, which have extremely high drive pressures or circuit racing, um, pro modified drag racing, more of your higher end where things are pushed to the limit to where there's limitations of the spring of your control strategy. I mean, as you know, a three port Mac valve, you'll get two to three times base spring pressure. Mm -hmm. That's your window. If you use a four port, you might get to four times. But with electronic wastegates, we can literally go from virtually no boost, gate wide open, to as much boost as your turbo system is capable of making simply in the software. And you don't have to change the spring. You don't have to do anything mechanically to it. It's just what your target pressure is. And to add more boost control window, like a lot of the drag racers in particular and the mile racers, those kind of guys and tractor pullers are running like a CO2, modulated CO2 control, right? To get yeah. even more pressure. Yeah, to overcome those mechanical forces. So you have this chamber and you put CO2 to get even more than you can get with the spring. But even with that, there is limitations. You know, the pulsation of the exhaust against the valve, especially when you're staging the car or at the top end of the track, will cause the valve to bounce and creep a bit. And we know this because we put data logging on these so we can see what the, the valve is actually doing. And if you take a pneumatic wastegate, any, any wastegate with a spring, you can overcome the force of that spring with your fingers. I, th I think a lot of people don't realize how much uh, back pressure a turbo can create. Two to three to one versus yeah. manifold pressure. It's, it's significant. You know, springs are typically rated on an ideal one to one. So manifold pressure and exhaust pressure are roughly the same from an efficiency standpoint mm -hmm. that works good too. But in the real world, typically, if you want a good spooling system, you know, the exhaust pressure will be higher than mm -hmm. the manifold pressure. By quite a bit. By quite a bit. We see two to three times fairly regularly. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things with electronic wastegates and our patented zero back drive gear train is those forces acting on the valve cannot move the valve. You cannot push this valve and make it open, period. The unit only consumes current when it's commanding the valve to move. If it's parked and everything's happy, there is no energy being used at all. The valve is stationary. 
I mean, one of the things is that, you know, I know about the pressure on the valve, and I said, man, Marty, that must be a hell of a stepper motor in there. It must take 40 amps to control it, to overcome, overcome the back pressure. But what did TurboSmart do to um, get around that without causing massive power drain and all that? Well, without showing everything that we've done is there's a very sophisticated gearbox and gear reduction system going on here. So there isn't a solenoid, there isn't a stepper motor that's directly pushing this valve up and down. There's a gear train in here and there's a lot of force compounding happening to get that valve to move to its position. So this is how we're able to take the valve from wide open and to push it close against up to 200 pounds of back pressure um, virtually seamlessly. And so the gear train really is the magic. And obviously our, also our, our sensor board, there's a few things going on in here too. So part of the control strategy has to understand the feedback, where is the valve right now compared to where I want it. So we actually have two different types of position sensors in here. We have a zero to five volt, and then we also have a PWM. Mm -hmm. um, Mtron particularly uses the PWM signal out of here. It has a much higher resolution but getting that feedback, where is my valve versus commanded, is mm -hmm. very important in your overall control strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other important thing to know about the control and why these are good at what they do is, with pneumatics, again, your boost control is a byproduct of a lot of things happening. Your control strategy with electronic waste gates is, I'm targeting this manifold pressure, and the gate is constantly moving around, chasing that manifold pressure. That mm -hmm. is it. So a perfect example, I just saw this a few weeks ago. It's happened before, but it came up again. Um, drag racing guy, he had a cracked collector on his turbo system. Mm -hmm. So what does that do to the boost, right? You start losing your drive pressure. Mm -hmm. The gate started shutting to compensate and make it work harder. Mm -hmm. Like it's chasing the manifold pressure. Mm -hmm. With pneumatics, you're typically not. You're sending a duty cycle to a solenoid and it's doing this to overcome the spring and it's chasing it to a certain extent, but not as directly as your control strategy with electronic gate. I mean, we've had that happen plenty of times. Sure. <laughs> like in, in racing, like the manifold cracks or uh, you get some kind of um, exhaust leak and the car just takes a dump. Because yeah, the, the gate's doing what it is supposed to do, but it's not reacting in real time like and, and this'll electronic like electronic scan. Help you get to the finish line maybe. It def well, it'll try. More than anything else anyway. <laughs> it will try. Again, we make hard parts and we, we, we do our best to make the best product in the world, um, but it's only as good as the software and the guy tuning the car, really. And with electronics, you're even more dependent on that. So it does take the proper software, the proper control strategy, you know, and the right tuner to really get the most out of them. So we're saying um, uh, it won't blow open or do anything that the, a pneumatic wastegate will do, like the, like the bad things, uh, it reacts quicker. And uh, I think the other thing is the amount of control you have, because uh, you know, I'm involved quite a bit in, with Pikes Peak racing, and you know, we start at about 7,000 feet and we end up at 14,000 feet. So boost control is always an issue. Yep. And if we're trying to maintain boost control, like as we get to the higher altitudes, we really have to look at overspeeding the turbo and causing a failure or running the turbo way off its efficiency island so you're pumping uh you know bacon hot gas into the engine sure. and, and with this uh you could have your uh altitude compensation too and Absolutely. and and, and uh, also look at uh shaft speed you know like most turbos nowadays have uh, provisions for uh, uh, shaft RPM, yep. and you can use that as feedback to control the wastegate. Like, try to maintain this boost level when you're not exceeding that shaft speed. And because, again, like I said before, the, the, the limits is, is only dictated by your imagination, your ability to write your control strategy. How about this? Find exactly where the peak efficiency in the map of the turbo is, and that shaft speed, and that's my map. I'm It'll targeting shaft there. speed. Whatever boost it makes, it makes. I don't care. This is where I want the turbo to run, and that's what it will do. And you can center it right in the peak efficiency island of the turbo if you want it sure, to. Sure, absolutely. And it obviously incorporate safeties too, but I mean, these are the things that it, it opens up, the opportunities. Now, uh, I think some of the questions like some of our viewers might have is, oh, with all this electronic cool stuff in there, uh, you know, wastegates get really hot. And I was looking at the specs, 
And the specs seem about equivalent to what a pneumatic wastegate can take as far as high temperatures. That, that would be correct. But what have you done, uh, like, are these susceptible to temperature at all? And what have you done to engineer around that? So I can tell you that the electronic wastegates overall temperature limitation is higher than a diaphragm wastegates is. And it's all about the actuator, right? The valve can handle anything, but it's about the actuator. Well, we don't have a diaphragm. We don't have springs that could lose tension. We don't have anything else that's affected by heat in here. In addition, the electronic wastegates are effectively the same valve and bowl and, and, and components in the base product. So, you know, our thermal insulating and the things that we do to help protect the actuator and the diaphragm gates also exist here, but is, it, is that a piece of ceramic? It's yeah. Oh, you have a. Oh, okay, yeah. that's secret. Huh? We have. So the, believe it or not, the the biggest area for heat transfer from the bowl or the valve into the actuator is actually the valve guide. Mm -hmm. So how can we isolate the valve guide from the actuator when they have to be contained as one mm -hmm. piece? Well, we use various things such as composite materials. The white thing. The white things and the heat dams and these other things which stop the thermal transfer about as good as you can get. And we're always trying to you know, increase that, but we have the highest in the industry and we're always trying to improve and that goes a long way. That's a, actually a pretty important innovation, I think. I've never seen anything like that. No, to my knowledge, no one else has done that. So we have that in our electronic wastegate. So we have the same type of thermal isolation as our pneumatics, but in addition, we also added water cooling. So the motor actually has, and you can't see it because it's machined in there, a water jacket around it. So when you talk about what are the things that temperature can impact, a lot of, the first thing comes to mind, it would be the, the wiring or the circuit board or the solder melting, and it, that's actually not the case. The real impact of heat on electronic wastegates is actually the magnets in the motor over a certain temperature, the magnets start becoming less effective. Yeah, I did able... not know that. Yeah, well, you know, we, we've learned a lot over the years. So that's really what we want to do, is we want to keep the temperature within a certain range to maximize the efficiency of the motor and keep it humming along. So we have an onboard thermal temp sensor here, and so you can program in certain safeties into your strategy where if a temperature gets over a certain amount, you can open the valve and kind of cool things down a bit. But the water jacket itself, pretty much handles everything. So in like our Bonneville car, for instance, we had a problem with uh, burning up the diaphragm and, um, and losing the tension in the springs from the heat. But uh, this actually has nothing like that that's susceptible. No. And, and the one susceptible part, uh, you can water cool if you want. It's water jacketed, correct. And uh, so it can actually take more heat than a regular waste. It gate. absolutely can. And I can tell you, so for example, the KTM GT2 endurance racing cars, the Expos, all run this gate, actually, the 50 millimeter waste gate in endurance racing. So you can imagine high arrow endurance is gonna beat things up as, as much as anything would. And they're running this with a MoTeC control system. I know like many, a couple of years ago, when you told me that you're coming out with these, I said, I don't know, man the heat's going to kill it. And, and you said, oh, don't worry about it. And it's good to actually see the guts of these and, um, and, and what's being done to uh, protect everything from heat and that it won't be an issue. It's important. It is important. Now, again, we still recommend doing the water cooling. It's, it's amazing how many people don't and they, and they work fine, but you know, we have to over, overstate it and be overly cautious to make sure that everything runs the way it should. The, the other thing that um, you've just come out with, well, I guess within the past year, that I'm really impressed with is the, uh, the straight flow wastegates. Um, and you're talking about, I mean, the obvious advantage is that it's got to flow because the exhaust gas just goes straight through. But you're talking about other advantages like, uh, like linear um, flow to valve position and things like that, right? Yeah, so in my personal opinion, it's easy for me to say this, but I think this is the best wastegate in the world, and, and, I'll, and I'll explain why. So first of all, like you said, the linear flow to valve position. So with any, and I'll use this pneumatic because it doesn't have a spring, um, these things flow a lot. But you achieve a whole lot of flow at very little lift. And then about past 10 millimeter, you're not gonna gain any, it's just flowing a ton. So your control window is very, very narrow, right? Because it flows so much as soon as it cracks off the seat. 
with this style, the flow is near linear to position. So we can get the flow. By the way, this flow is, I believe, 10% more than this. Than your the than big, 60 the big 60. Right, so this flow is roughly 10% more. Why? Well, the air doesn't have to turn 90 degrees, and the butterfly doesn't up interrupt the airstream as much as this big valve does. But you get the flow of a very large weight skate, but the control resolution of a very small one because you can just pinch it down to whatever you want. I want just a little bit. And again, it's so, it, it's so close to linear, it's easier to control. The other thing that you know, is very important, as I said earlier, we're fighting exhaust drive pressure, back pressure, always. It's, a, it's affecting everything. This style of valve and the shape of it, and you'll see it's very contoured. Mm -hmm. It's not just a flat piece of metal, because that won't work. It's almost like an airplane wing in there. It's very much like an airplane wing. It's self-balancing. So drive pressure doesn't have an impact on this, or nearly as much. So we can take this and literally just take this actuator off and put this thing about half open, and it'll just sit there. Because the flow going past it is the same as the flow going the other way. Mm -hmm. So it just balances itself out. So it requires far less current to control because it's balanced. And again, that linearity of flow gives you just such fine resolution. Um, it's, it's, it's really a game changer. Oh, that's the other thing I almost forgot about. Remember when you first told me about that? And I go, I bet you that takes 40 amps. And I go, wow, that's gonna have to be a lot of planning in the car's electrical system. But you assured me that was not gonna be an issue. So how much power do these typically require? Average between seven and 12 amps of power. So a little that's bit- That's what we see in operation. Now we do have to overstate, here's your window, and it's all available in our data sheets. Because again, we don't have control over who's using this product. And we do have a big presence in diesel drag racing. And they run 150 pounds plus manifold pressure. So they get up in the 200 PSI range of drive pressure with five kits of nitrous. So I've got to be able to drive this valve shut against all of that pressure and nitrous. So that's what takes the current is when the valve is fully open to shove it closed against that. We aren't using any current when the valve is parked. If everything's happy and the valve's not being commanded to move, it's not using any juice, right? It's just going from one extreme to the other where you would see you know, th the spike in energy consumption, but again, the average between seven and 12 amps on pretty much everything, and it hasn't been an issue. So worst case, your big fuel system and your big electric fan's gonna take more power than Correct. one of these. Yeah, so, your electric water pump take more juice than this. Yeah, don't, don't, so don't worry about it. I wouldn't sweat it. Now we do recommend, and, and most ECU manufacturers recommend, an H-bridge driver to isolate the current from the ECU, because the outputs on the ECU typically don't like a lot of current. Mm -hmm. um, your Haltech, you know, your Nexus system does have much higher outputs or whatever, but um, you know, an H-bridge box is, is, we require it really, we tell people they need to do it. And if your ECU doesn't have it, or they don't have native support, um, we have our black box, so this is our integrator. So this has dual H-bridge drivers in it, it's got a CAN bus as well. Um, it does overcurrent protection for the product as well, and your ECU. And if you have an ECU such as a Holly or something else that doesn't have native support, but it does have a PWM output that you're used to using with a, you know, a three port Mac, you can use that control strategy fed into here and it will convert that signal over to the zero to 12 volt direct drive and run the E-gate. So like, let's say you have a factory turbo car that can PWM control boost pressure and it's tuned with like an access port or HP tuners or something like that, if you use that, would you be able to use these wastegates? Theoretically, yes, but we're not quite there. Okay. Um, and the reason why is because that PWM signal typically isn't as tunable as you'd like as a standalone ECU, but stay tuned, we might have something for you. That, our goal is to actually have this be able to work with factory ECUs as well. So I, I think that in a future would be a release, big I part of the market. For sure, um, believe it or not though, it's shocking how well this has been received and how it's going with, you know, with at least four major ECU manufacturers having native support for them. And you know, the things that we've seen people be able to do with them has just been beyond our wildest expectations. So it's been going pretty good. So what ECUs have native support? Mtron, Mtron was the first, then FuelTech, and then Haltech. Um, MoTeC obviously can support anything because you write your own firmware. So there's a lot of MoTeC applications running E-gates as well. And the Holly guys, 
the Holly doesn't have native support, but the Holly with the PWM, the guys are using the black box. So um, last year's Drag Week winner, um, quite a few guys running Holly are using the black box and they're doing it seamlessly. So it's working very well. But those are the big, those are the big ECU manufacturers are the most popular that we would think of and they all do. We also have Bosch Motorsports um, just recently. So Bosch Motorsports has very high-end bespoke um, ECU controls for diesels, racing diesels, and they're using the black box as well. Okay. So the, about the only drawback is that uh, your tuner will have to have a, some learning curve of how to like PWM everything, right? And the, the map, boost maps are gonna be probably quite a bit different, right? Typically, the, you're, if, you're, if you have a PWM system you're using a black box, it's not any different than what you're used to. Oh, really? So you're going to program it exactly the same, and this is going to basically translate that signal. Now, if you're using a Haltech or a FuelTech or an Mtron, their native support, actually, it's drop-down boxes, and they've made it very simple, too. It's when you want to do something. Uh, I have an idea. How about this? Well, I have a GPS signal, and I've mapped the track. Mm -hmm. Sydney Motorsports, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to do boost by track position. Yeah, that would okay? be awesome. You can totally do that, but you're going to write an advanced table to do that, mm -hmm. right? So that's where you start you know, getting more complex, but it absolutely can do that. Or if you wanted to do target shaft speed. So your native control won't have that as an option. So you'll have to go into one of the advanced functions or advanced tables and program that in. But the gu typically the guys that are going this direction mm -hmm. know how to do that or their tuner is definitely capable well, most of guys that are smart enough to tune totally get it but it's it's very similar to you know programming your fuel injection system and this and that right you you at this area i want this much output at this area i want this much output it's kind of the same thing they operate very similar to a throttle body in that's you know swing open close zero to five volts you know feedback so it's not something that no one can't get their head around man there's so many things you could do with this like you could hold the turbo closed you could have a turbo size for quick response but then you could uh keep it out of surge by uh looking at shaft speed over sure. over boost pressure over rpm uh yep. you you have total flexibility and total control of the the boost which you don't get with pneumatics that is the goal i mean we've done great with pneumatics and everyone does and we're not going away from that and you know it's a great thing but it's just what's next you know people don't go to the track to go the same speed or go slower than the last time or whatever. Or look, what's next? What else can I do? How can I get another couple of tenths out of my lap time or whatever? Well, it'd be really cool if I could do blah. Well, this is our part of the industry where we can help people do that. Just maximize their turbo efficiency, maximize the performance of their turbo system and, and truly put people in full control. Well, I can't wait till we have some, some project where we could uh, actually use this technology. And yeah. Probably be one of our um, Pikes Peak things That's first. That's probably the ideal place for it. Right. I would say. Yeah. Um, and then you brought this along. Now, what's what's this? Well, you had seen it before at SEMA, and it's it, it's evolved. This is version two, but it's surprising how popular this little guy is. This is our oil pressure regulator. So, as many people know, that you know, turbo smoking um, can be a problem and is is quite prevalent in our industry, and yeah, we had the same issue with some of our shop cars. I mean, we're very similar. We've got all kinds of R&D cars and shop cars. And we were chasing a problem with a smoking turbo. And it, the turbo was mounted kind of low. And that particular car had very high oil pressure. And a lot of cars do, they right? You tune the orifice size, the restrictor. Yeah, so you change the restrictor, or you put a nitrous pill, and you do these things. But again, that restricts the flow, and it, and it does a great job of atomizing the oil. But it's not really lowering the pressure any. So what can we do? So one of our, you know, we've, we've got some brilliant engineers in our business and I, I give them all the credit. Um, they started playing around with bypass systems and ways to reduce the oil pressure to that. And this all came down to, he was researching the bearing system in the turbos. It's like, well, these, these bearings are designed for something. What is the design criteria? How much oil do they really need? And the general consensus was around 40 PSI. That's all they need, a ball bearing system. Mm -hmm. like, and so, okay, what can we do to just get it down to 40 PSI? And um, our guys have come, like I said, this is version two, but this guy does not restrict the flow, right? So it gives it nice, clean flow, but it lowers the pressure. It has an internal bypass system, and it lowers the pressure between 40 and 42 PSI to that bearing cartridge at any time. 
So you can be on a full pull and the motor's making 150 PSI, that turbo's only gonna get 40. And it becomes a problem when you lift off the gas. It's got all this pressure and something, you lift it off the gas and everything's kind of slowing down and the turbo's just getting hammered with oil and it's flooding the cartridge and not all turbos have a really great oil retention system. So it overflows into the turbine housing, you have that off throttle smoke. You see it on dyno runs or on the straightaways or whatever. And I know like all you people out there, if you've been playing with turbos long enough, you, you've, you've run into this before. And, uh, and this helps a lot of them. I can't say it's the magic cure, but it, it is a pretty good band-aid for a lot of systems that aren't ideal or the drain's not ideal. So let's just limit the oil pressure to about 40 PSI to that thing and great things seem to come. And this is one of our most popular products in the world now. And, and it was just trying to solve a problem. And that's what we do. We're not trying to specifically sell you on these things. We're just trying to help our guys go better, go faster, or solve problems. I just told you you had to bring this because, I mean, I wish this was around a lot longer. It would have saved a lot of headache that I've run into over the years. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it's economical. I mean, it's just a great, I, I just put it on everything. And we have some turbo, you know, aftermarket sellers that just, you know, suggest them with every turbo sale just to, it, it has stopped so many warranty claims coming in. My turbo smoking whatever, and they can't find anything wrong with a turbo. And, Ah, let's just low, 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 you know, get the oil pressure down to about 40 and it seems to fix it up. So all your wastegates come with uh, all the specifications that will help your tuner uh, set them up. And uh, about the only disadvantage is that uh, these aren't for dummies in particular. <laughs> um, you have to be at least a little smart to be able to exploit these to their fullest capability. But any tuner that's worth its salt will get it right away. I mean, I feel. Yeah, they're not for everyone, but for people that are looking to get to that next level or people are looking to do something a bit different, you know, we have a solution for you. Again, we're not walking away from pneumatic wastegates. Um, they're, they're a great product and, and we do great with that. But our goal is to literally have something for every form of, you know, motorsports that has, you know, forced induction and also help people get to that next level. Like what else is there that can be done? Um, we're always moving forward. We don't sit on our, we don't, we don't make widgets. We're, we're a group of enthusiasts that are looking to do better ourselves and we want to help people go faster and do better. And I love coming in Monday morning here and all the great stuff people have done with our products. And, and you're the only, uh, you're, you are currently the only supplier of aftermarket electronically controlled wastegates, right? That is correct. Um, there's a marine company that makes like an actuator they can retrofit to some Mercury Marine stuff. They're like 4,000, they're incredibly expensive and not really applicable for this market. Um, we are definitely the only commercial company and um, we don't claim to be the inventors of electronic wastegates. OEs are doing it, you know, um, in various ways, whatever. Um, but we're the only company making them commercially, you know, commercially available and viable for the enthusiast market or, you know, the, the motorsports guy. Um, they're stocked in all four facilities around, our wor around the world. Um, yeah, we, we, we do quite well with them. We want to make sure people can get a hold of them. And to sum it up, I would say the biggest advantages are you can get the biggest, fattest power and torque curve. You can get the most reliability out of your turbo because you can keep it out of overspeed. And those are the two biggest things. Um, I mean, there's all those other advantages we talked about, but that's what your average guy can experience with uh, the, these uh, wastegates. And the other big thing where you say, what's the true benefit to consumer? You don't have to touch it. <clears throat> you'll never touch it, right? So on a racing season, you know, like on Robbie's car, whatever, you'll go through things and do maintenance. You might check the diaphragms or whatever. Yeah, Unfortunately, well, we don't have a lot of problems, but you'll check those things. We change There's, them every season, typically. Just because, right? Right. Just to, like, just to change them every season, freshen them up. You don't do that with these. You, you put them on and you don't touch them again, right? Everything's done through the software. There's no spring to adjust. There's no wear components per se. There's literally nothing in here that requires any sort of maintenance or repair ever. So you just go. And this week I ran this or I'm running at this track and I want another 30 pounds of boost, change my target and my software. I'm not touching the gates or doing anything mechanically to the system. Well, well thank you for coming out here, Marty. And I'm really glad you came here because, uh, you know, if I had to talk about this, that. I don't have hands-on familiar, familiarity with. I would have been, uh, okay, this is electronic and it's good. <laughs> but There's a lot going on in them. 
Yeah, and the, you taught me a lot of things about the gearbox and uh, the temperature control things and the power. All, all my concerns have been addressed, so I, I have total confidence in running one of these now. Um, so I hope you guys like that, and uh, now you have a good understanding about the advantages of electronic wastegates. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, you can write them in the comments below, and uh, we'll attempt to answer them. No, I'll answer them. I'll watch it, too. Yeah. Okay. You know? And uh, now it's time for our Moto IQ commercial. Um, we, you know, we have our merch, so you can go to our web store that we just opened. Uh, check it out. Uh, you can get our shirts, our jackets, um, hats. We also have a whole store f of parts. If you buy our parts from us, it helps uh, sponsor us and helps us uh, do all these YouTube things for your entertainment. Um, so please check out our store. Um, if you want to get your car or engine built by us, uh, go to our garage services link on the Moto IQ website. Uh, click on that, fill the form out, we'll get back to you. Uh, our website has thousands of tech articles. You could probably spend a year reading them all, so check that out. Uh, our YouTube channel, we're beginning to get a lot of content, so you know if you like hardcore car stuff, uh, check out the rest of the content on our YouTube channel. So thank you for uh, coming out, and we'll see you next time. And if I can add one thing, if you're coming to SEMA, you must come by the Turbo Smart booth. We're doing our biggest product launch in the history of the business this year with over 50 new products showing up. And you can catch our news and everything at turbosmart.com. And the PRI show. PRI show for sure. We'll see you again next time. Thanks.